Jessica, thank you very much for doing CPD for us today. Um, for anyone listening externally, um, if you would be kind enough to give a donation to Vets with Horsepower, sadly they're not able to um, go ahead this year. So we are doing an alternative plan of some online CPD, brilliant value, donate whatever you are able to uh, for a really, really good cause. Thank you very much, Jessica. My pleasure. Should we, should we make a start then? Yes, please. Excellent. So what, what we're going to talk about today is intensive care of the foal in a practice setting. And again, as we discussed last week, one of the difficulties with foals is that we don't, none of us do this year round. And so you sort of fall out of the, of being in the groove for doing foals. And sick foals are, are particularly daunting because things happen very quickly. Um, but I think the way really I want to focus this talk is to say that we are very fortunate that we have some tremendous foal experts around the globe. And when, when the situation arises that we are able to utilize them, that's absolutely fantastic. But it's not always an option. It's not always an option to refer. There might not be somewhere close enough to refer. It's a very expensive proposition and the clients may not wish to go down that route. So really the, the way I've set this talk up is to say that if you're in that situation, there's an awful lot you can do. And particularly if you have a, if you have a clinic, you could also transfer all of these points and all of these protocols and just the general thought process of how to deal with sick falls. This is, this will cover both dealing with it at, a, at an owner's premises or dealing with it in a clinic. Now, the advantage to dealing with it in a clinic, of course, is that you will have, you will have more people and spreading the 24-hour-a-day care is a little bit easier, but it is applicable to both. So the reason that I put this picture in of the lion is it's, this, this picture always m makes me think, is this really something that you want to start? And my short answer is, yes, you do want to try this because it's really amazing the results that you can get with um, looking after sick foals in a practice setting. But it gets a little bit bewildering sometimes in terms of the sheer number of things that you need to take into consideration, not just dealing with your examination, but dealing with your differential diagnoses and how to set up a treatment plan. So. I'm going to try to work through this logically and try to give you sort of a flow chart of how to do that. I'm not going to talk about anything that would be within the remit of a referral hospital only. So I'm not going to talk about constant rate infusions and pressure pumps and ventilators. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to leave that out because that's we're, what we're talking about today is what is practical. So if we think about septicemia and foals, this is really, this is the most common cause of morbidity and mortality in neonatal foals. And most foal deaths actually occur within the first week and often within the first 24 hours. Now, when you're dealing with owners, this is, this is upsetting for the vets when these foals die. It's very upsetting for the owners. They may have just one foal. They've been waiting for this foal for the better part of a year. So they're often pretty emotional situations, but Again, let's look at this positively that we can actually save quite a number of these falls. So the reason that I, that I base this on septicemia is that it's a very good template for intensive care of the fall because all of the treatments that you would have, that you would consider to use in the case of septicemia are treatments that you could apply to other conditions, sort of outweigh the scope of this talk because otherwise we would go on for hours and hours and hours. But the, all of these treatment principles are applicable to other conditions as well. So if we're talking about septicemia in foals, then we are looking at a condition that is characterized really by progressive weakness, depression, and the loss of suckle reflex. Now, one of the main conditions that you have to try to distinguish from septicemia is neonatal maladjustment syndrome or neonatal hypoxia or whatever the dummy foal or whatever the, whatever the term that you're familiar with using, which is a hypoxic insult to these foals. There can be a fairly substantial overlap between the two, but generally, septicemic foals generally 
are actually born normal. They look clinically normal and then they start to have a decline. There are obviously exceptions that test this rule, but the same applies for dummy foals. Usually they are abnormal from the get-go, but we'll talk a little bit about what to do if you think you might have one that has a bit of both. Again, as we discussed last week when we were talking about foaling emergencies, because of the way the setup of the mare's placenta, there is no transplacental passage of antibodies. So the foals are born immunonaive and they're basically a sitting duck in that first day until they get some antibodies through the mare's colostrum. So if that step in the process doesn't happen, we've got a foal that has no resistance to infection. Now, if we have a foal that for some reason can't nurse because it's unwell, if we don't have a foal that nurses, not only are we going to be losing the antibody supply, but we're also going to end up with a foal that's hypoglycemic, dehydrated, they often become hypothermic, they get depressed, and then they have very little energy and they just, they aren't going to make an effort to get up to nurse. And so then we get into this picture in the lower left hand, which is our, which is our downward spiral here. And then it's just, it's, it's a, it goes on from there. And then we have further lack of nursing and the, the problem compounds itself. Our predisposing factors for septicemia in the foal, failure of passive transfer is obviously a big one. Um, and, and again, it's sort of a chicken and an egg thing. A, a, Foal can have failure of passive transfer and then develop an infection off the back of that. Or if you have a foal that is affected quite early and then doesn't nurse, then they're not going to get their colostrum and they're going to have failure of passive transfer. If we have premature or dismature foals, these are also going to be at risk for septicemia simply because pretty much everything, all of their organs and particularly their immune system are very immature and, and are not ready to function properly. Premature cord, cord separation of birth. I put three question marks after this one because it's entrenched in the older literature that a foal gets between a third and a quarter of the blood supply after it's born through the umbilical cord that's still attached to its body. That actually has, has been refuted to a degree, but this is the rationale for once a mare has foaled and is lying down and the foal is still lying down and is still attached to the umbilical cord to leave them. And as with, as with any sort of herd animal, poor hygiene or overcrowding is, is going to be a predisposing factor. And remember that the foal's umbilicus is, it's naturally open to allow final fluid secretions to drain but of course it's ventrally on the foal and it's going to be what's in contact with bedding and soil and feces very frequently in the periods that the foal spends lying down. So in terms of, in terms of the infection that the foal picks up, and, and we'll talk about the, the variety of infections that they can manifest or the most common ones, it's usually the environment, but they can get infections from the mare. So the, one of the outliers to that the foal was normal when it was born is if there's a transplacental infection. So in other words, the foal, the foal already was infected or septicemic before it was actually born. And what always flags this up to me is a newborn foal should not have a raised fibrinogen because remember this is a acute phase protein that takes two to three days to go up. It's, it's induced. So you shouldn't have a, a newborn foal with a raised fibrinogen unless something was already brewing or percolating from there. Clinical signs of septicemia, pretty much as you'd expect. Dullness, reluctance to nurse. Again, this goes back to our downward spiral. They become increasingly weak. They don't want to then get up. Septicemic foals often have very cold extremities. The, the, the blood flow is poor. They will often have uh, injected mucous membranes or even toxic mucous membranes. But remember that petechial hemorrhages on a foal's sclera in the immediate postpartum period is actually not really a cause for concern because the scleral hemorrhages are usually just from compression when the foal is being born. But where you don't want to see them is you don't want to see them on the mucous membranes or inside the ear or if you have a filly foal inside the vulva. And then these very, these very generic findings are accompanied by signs that are specific to the organ system which is actually manifesting the infection. And it's important to remember that you can have multiple sites of infection. So we can have foals that have enteritis, gastroenteritis, diarrhea, enterocolitis, 
be keep an eye out for the ones where they have bloody diarrhea because that is often a necrotizing enterocolitis and those foals those foals can um, expire very very quickly to me they remind me of the smell of a dog with parvo it's that it's that horrible smell that you get the um, infection can localize in joints now this is a this is a septic arthritis in foals is a is a whole different is a whole different talk um, but if we're talking about septic arthritis in the neonates, so the very young foals, these are foals that have septic arthritis as a manifestation of septicemia, in other words, a, a, a circulating infection. This is, this is different from the slightly older foals where the foal is clinically normal, but it has an infected joint. So this is, this is a manifestation of these youngsters. A point that I want to make is that you can palpate an effusion in a foal before you can see it and be very careful with owners that tell you that the mare stepped on the foal. It happens, but mares usually aren't really interested in stepping on their foals. And it's much more likely that the foal actually has an infected joint if it's gone acutely lame. So just, just bear that in mind. But it, it takes no time at all when you're examining these foals. They're quite small. Palpate every joint. You can't feel an effusion in the hip. Very difficult in the shoulder, um, but sometimes you can feel it. You can, and you can feel it really in all of the other joints. So run your fingers over them. It, it doesn't take any time at all. And as I say, you'll pick more up earlier by palpation than just visually looking at them. We can have it manifest itself as a, as a respiratory condition. Now, respiratory infections in foals are um, have some different clinical signs than they do in adult horses. And actually, foals don't, they tend not to cough very much with respiratory disease. It's not to say they can't, but it's just not a common manifestation. When I'm looking at a foal's respiratory rate and effort, I try to do it from outside the box before I've even gone into the box because you'll often, their respiratory rate will go up. And certainly if you're chasing them around to try to get hold of them, you're not going to really get an accurate reading. Um, the other thing to say about clinical examination for foals with respiratory disease is that because the foals are a higher percentage of body water and because they have much less fat and their chests are thinner, the sounds are always much louder. They are conducted more easily. So you have to get your ear in on listening to foals' chests. They will always sound much louder than you'd expect in an adult horse. And sometimes this makes it a little bit more difficult to, to identify the adventitious lugging sounds, as, as we would call them. Um, and as you can see in the radiograph on the right, radiography of a foal's chest is, is very feasible. The umbilical structures are probably one of the, the most important structures to consider. So remember that these are not sealed over when the foal is born by design. And over the first four to seven days, the umbilicus dries up and then it, eventually it just looks like a little twig and then it just falls off flush with the body wall. The, the post foaling care of a foal's umbilicus, um, and we, we did discuss this last week, to try to avoid uh, try to avoid iodine simply because it's very easy for particularly owners to just mix up strengths of iodine. And if you use 7% iodine that you would use in a calf, all you're going to do is burn the outer edges and the skin, and you're going to close off that normal mechanism for, for drainage and, and for it to dry up. So I, I like to use 0.5% chlorhexidine diluted with water, and I just put it in a little urinalysis pot and then just dip the umbilicus three or four times a day. One thing to be very careful with with umbilical structures is to remember that a large component of the what are called the umbilical remnants are actually inside the abdomen and so you can't palpate them externally so even if a foal the picture on the left that's this is a, a thickened and moist and slightly discharging umbilicus and the one on the right's fairly obviously abnormal as well, but you can certainly have a foal where everything externally looks fine. And this is where ultrasonography of the umbilical remnants internally is invaluable. So from a practical point of view, just remember that you can have a foal whose umbilicus externally looks completely fine, but there is still a problem. We can have involvement of the abdominal cavity. We can have a widespread peritonitis. 
Now, uveitis is quite interesting, actually, because this can be a, this is not pathognomonic for a particular type of septicemia. Um, it is, but if you get a severe and acute uveitis in a foal, the top differential for that is rhodococcus. So not all uveitis in foals is, is rhodococcus, but it is, it is definitely one to consider and it's a recognized manifestation. Okay, so how are we gonna make our diagnosis? Well, in a, in, a, in a very, in an academic sense, a true diagnosis of septicemia in a foal, and by septicemia, we're most usually talking about bacteremias, but certainly viremias and very occasionally fungal infections are possible as well. So when we talk about septicemia, we're talking about a, a variety of causative infectious agents. So the true diagnosis would actually be based on isolation of the organisms, but this probably happens in fewer than 50% of the cases. If you're, if you're in a situation where you can, you can take blood cultures, and taking a blood culture is very easy to do, it's just whether you have the culture medium to do them, but if you are going to do a blood culture, then you have more chance of culturing a bacterium if you do it while the foal is having a pyrexic episode. However, only about 30% of septic foals actually show a pyrexia, and they can be normothermic, and, and some of them are actually hypothermic, quite a few of them are hypothermic as well. The top picture, actually, this is probably not done as frequently as, as it may be useful. This is actually doing a, tra a, a true transtracheal wash in a foal. Um, the advantage to doing this is that you, is a couple of things. You're not potentially collecting bacteria via an endoscope from the upper respiratory tract, but also in foals that have a degree of respiratory compromise, actually sticking an endoscope up one nostril is, a, is enough to cause them significant respiratory distress. And you have to be very careful doing this in terms of the amount of fluid that you put into these foals because it is possible that they, it can completely decompromise them. So again, if we have an increased respiratory rate or effort, this certainly, we should be then considering the respiratory tract as part of the problem. Our, our laboratory aids are going to be very useful, but again, there's no set pattern to these necessarily. So our red blood cell count, if we have a profoundly low red blood cell count, we have two main possibilities in foals. We either have a, an anemic foal who, who um, didn't get enough blood from the mare, or we can have some form of hemolysis. And, and, mo and the most frequent thing that we'd be looking for there is neonatal isoerythrolysis in foals or the jaundiced foal. White blood cell count can be, can be completely variable. If you, but if you have a sick foal, my feeling is that I would much rather have a sick foal that has a high white blood cell count and a high fibrinogen than a foal that has a profoundly low white blood cell count and low fibrinogen because at least I know that the, they can produce them. They can produce the fibrinogen and they can release the white blood cell count. Remember white blood cell counts are just a balance between production and consumption. So if you have a really, really low white blood cell count, the most likely thing is they're being completely over consumed rather than underproduced. But in general, I would, I would prefer to see the, if, if they're abnormal, I'd prefer to see them on the high side rather than the low side. Um, total protein, again, useful. We can't use total protein for an estimation of IgG the way it's possible to do in calves. It just doesn't work that way. So we have to do different tests for IgG. Fibrinogen and serum amyloid A, really interesting and actually probably a whole discussion in itself. So I'll try to keep it short. The, the downside to fibrinogen is that it, it takes two to three days to go up. So you can have a sick foal with a normal fibrinogen and it's just the fibrinogen is on its way up. However, when you're monitoring resolution, when your fibrinogen falls back to normal, that's a very positive finding. And really none of these tests are a standalone. They're much more useful when you're looking at trends and when you're looking for um, how the blood work is progressing. Now, serum amyloid A, I think there's a huge, um, a huge division of opinion on the usefulness of this in foals. But there is, to date, no convincing evidence to say that serum amyloid A 
is a consistently useful inflammatory marker in foals. So for instance, you can have very poorly foals that have a serum amyloid A of zero. So uh, it hasn't been, it just hasn't been validated enough yet. And um, there's some work that is in process at the University of Illinois at the moment looking at this. And so I think what I would say about SAA is if you can run it and it's very high, that's probably useful information. But if it's, if it's low or normal, don't just discount that that means everything is okay. Um, bilirubin, urea, and creatinine. Urea and creatinine, this is, these will go up with, urea and creatinine will go up specifically with, it'll go up with renal disease, it'll also go up with um, dehydration. But remember that there is something called spurious hypercreatinemia in newborn foals, which is foals that are completely normal and they just have a very high creatinine for a few days. So if you have, if you find this in a normal a foal that you feel is clinically normal, then keep an eye on the foal and recheck the blood and, and you want to see that it's going to start falling over the, the next few days. And if that's the case, then it's generally not cause for concern. Your analysis, again, if you, if you feel that you have an infection pertaining to the urinary tract, it's the same parameters apply as do for adult horses, but your analysis is particularly useful in foals with respect to urine specific gravity. And it's important enough that I'll talk about it in its own right. Blood glucose in foals, again, very, very important. This is, if we have blood glucose that's too low, we're going to end up with a foal that is probably going to start seizuring. If we have a foal that has blood glucose that's too high, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to spill over into the urine and you're going to end up with a, um, you're going to end up with a foal that is predisposed to a urinary tract infection. Now I put blood gas in parentheses. People always get fixed on arterial blood gases, which are useful, super useful. There's no question about it, but venous blood gases often get overlooked. And a, a venous blood gas is, is very, very useful. It's what it's not going to do is it's not going to give you a PaO2. So it's not going to give you an oxygen saturation, but it's going to give you everything else. And so particularly if you if you want something like a base excess because you've got a foal that has perhaps has diarrhea or respiratory acidosis, a, a venous blood gas, if, if you have a foal in a clinic, it can be a very useful thing to do. And then of course, we're going to take samples from our particular body systems that we feel are, um, are involved. So we're going to, it could be uh, transtracheal wash, it could be a, a fecal sample. It's again, it's going to depend on which, which body system you think is infected. Okay, so let's look at general principles of treatment. And again, this is general principles of treatment of septicemia, but these treatment protocols and the rationale for them are applicable to other conditions that you would find in a foal. A couple of things about foals is we can't treat them like little adult horses because things happen much more quickly. We can't do a step back, wait and see, because then we're very likely to lose that foal. If you're going to extrapolate, the best extrapolation is to neonates of other species. So we do need to, we do need to take quite a, a proactive approach to treating these foals. And actually you can't just say, we'll see how it is tomorrow because you may end up with a bit of a disaster on your hands. So if we're talking about antibiotics, again, we really want to try to use bactericidal drugs versus bacteriostatic. And initially we want to administer them intravenously, okay? We cannot wait for culture and sensitivity results. We need to get these folds started on some form of antibiotics. And while probably 90% of causative bacteria are gram negatives, there is still a role for um, broad spectrum antibiotics that will cover gram positive bacteria as well. And so one common combination is an aminoglycoside and some form of penicillin. Now, from a very practical point of view, if we're trying to deal with this with an owner, we don't want to be, it's not feasible to be heading out to an owner's premises four times a day to give it crystalline penicillin if you can get hold of it. So we may need to adjust our antibiotic regime based on just using common sense really, because what works on paper is not necessarily what's going to actually work in the field. 
Here's a list of antibiotics. The, the one that actually is, is not on this list is cefquinome, which is cobactin, which um, is difficult to get hold of at the moment. Chloramphenicol, I, I add that in here. I put a little star. This is just nasty stuff. You don't want, you do really don't want to deal with this. You know, if it's in a tube of eye ointment, that's probably fine, but you don't really want to be dealing with the actual drug itself. So this used to be really the one of the main antibiotics we had for falls that had meningitis because it's one of the it's one of the few antibiotics that cross the blood brain barrier. But now, fortunately, some of the cephalosporins, third and fourth generation, actually do cross the blood brain barrier. So we really fortunately don't need to very much use chloramphenicol anymore. But if you if you come near it, just be very, very careful with it. So when you see this little light bulb, this is a sort of a top tip. So one practical consideration is how long do I know that I've treated this foal long enough? So what I would do is I would, I would treat the foal with antibiotics until all the clinical signs have resolved and my temperature, fibrinogen, white blood cell count, and my SAA, assuming it was, it's reliable, have been normal for 72 hours. So you want, you want three more days of antibiotics after, they, after they're clinically normal and all of their laboratory work has returned to normal. And then recheck all the blood work one week later unless you suspect there's a problem in the meantime. Okay, now we need to think about blood volume and gamma globulins. And this is where our IgG comes into it. And I've, I've lumped these together because they are, um, Blood volume also falls under fluid therapy, but it, but it is, when we're look, talking about plasma, it um, will also contribute not only gamma globulins, but to our blood volume. Okay, so it's really important to remember that foals can absorb oral colostrum up to about 16 hours of age. By the time, even by the time they're 16 hours of age, however, their, their gut is closing down to being receptive to uh, enteral absorption of of anything, but particularly the, the gamma globulins that we're interested in this case. So oral colostrum is in that first little window of opportunity. And generally for a normal size foal, you want to give them between a liter and a liter and a half of colostrum, probably split into three or four separate feeds every few hours. Again, this gets labor intensive and you can probably give them a bit more. Again, you have to weigh it up against the practicalities of where you're actually trying to trying to do this. But really after about 16 to 18 hours, giving anything orally is not going to be absorbed. So then we're looking at plasma. And you can get commercially available plasma and you can get various forms of, of hyperimmune plasma. Um, so if you're dealing with a stud farm that has a, say, a problem with rhodococcus, you can get, you can get plasma that has additional antibodies to rhodococcus and the various other ones that you can get. The real downside to this is it's expensive. There's no question about it. So it's perfectly possible, as in this picture just here, to make plasma. Okay, so here I was just showing some vet students how to make plasma. You can see we haven't gotten all the red blood cells out. This is plasma that I that we made from this false mare. If anyone wants to know how to do that, I can tell you it's not it's not particularly complicated to do. But again, this is, a, this is a very practical option when this is not an option. If we have a foal that is anemic, and particularly if we have a foal that we think has neonatal isoerythrolysis or NI, then, then what we're looking for more is whole blood in terms of our blood volume, because what they're missing is they're missing red blood cells rather than IgG. Okay. And it's, it's important to remember that if you have a, a septic foal, it will require more IgG to raise their IgG levels than a normal foal. So for instance, and depending on which units you use, so if we say, if we say an acceptable IgG is over eight, if you have a normal foal and its IgG is four, you will probably get it to eight or close to with a liter of plasma. If you have a, if you have a sick foal that has an IgG of four, you may only raise it to five or six. So just remember that you're going to actually and don't, don't panic if, it's, if it doesn't look like it's going up as much as it should, that's very normal. Okay, another practical point, and this is, for, this is for backyard owners or individual owners rather than stud farms. So you've got a mare and it doesn't have any colostrum and you phoned around and you can't find any colostrum anywhere. What are you going to do? Okay, 
you're going to hop in your car or you're going to send someone off and you're going to buy full fat cow's milk to give to this bowl, okay? Because particularly at whatever time of night it is, you're very unlikely to, if you can't rustle up some colostrum, you're very unlikely to find another option. And the reason to do this is that if foals don't have something into their, into their digestive system within three hours of being born to feed and to stimulate the enterocytes, the gut starts closing. And this means that, this means that there is the high likelihood that if you then give the foal further oral treatments to try to raise its IgG, it's not actually going to work. So let's talk a little bit about IgG testing. And what we're always, I suppose what, what is very commonly said is that test the foal after 24 hours because, and then decide what to do based on the reading. Okay, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Because then by, by 24 hours plus, whatever the IgG reading is, is what the, is the best you're gonna get for that foal. But the downside to that is if you, if you leave the testing until that time frame, you don't have any other option but to give the foal plasma. And again, as we've discussed, that's expensive and it's not as, it's sometimes difficult to get hold of and some practices don't keep it in stock. So the other option that you can do is you can test the foals, say at 18 hours, okay? Now, if you do that, you're still probably not streets ahead because you still, if you wanted to give them oral colostrum, you still don't have that, uh, you've lost your window of opportunity for what the gut can absorb. But it's also reasonable to say that a foal that the, an IgG test at 18 hours will probably give a slightly lower value than what it will be at 24. So if you're, if you test them at 18 hours and you're pretty close to an acceptable level, and you don't have a very sick foal, you're probably going to get there by 24 hours. So the other way to do it is actually to test them at about eight to 12 hours of age, because most of the IgG is going to have been absorbed at this point. The downside to this is you're not going to get a reading of what your, ultimately what your final IgG level is going to be. But the big advantage to this in a practice setting is that if it is low, you can still give colostrum because the gut is still open and will absorb the antibodies. And ideally you want to have a, at least, depending on your units, if you use milligrams for deciliter, 400 or four, um, you, should, you should have at least this level at this point to have a good chance that by using further oral colostrum, you'll get to where you need to go. Okay. Now we need to consider about fluids, electrolytes, acid base, and glucose balance. Okay. So maintenance fluid requirements in foals are somewhere between 80 and 100 mils per kilogram per day, and that's roughly 10% of the foal's body weight. This varies by the age of the foal, but if we're talking about foals in the first couple days of life, that's reasonable. It's, a, it's a, not a fun situation when you're called out to see a foal and the foal is completely flat out and unresponsive. And the, the best thing to do for these, I think, is to give them an immediate bolus of a liter of warm Hartman's. And it's amazing sometimes when these foals are collapsed because their cardiovascular system is collapsing because they're so dehydrated. It's amazing what they can, what this can do for the foals. And, and I'll tell you a little protocol of, of how to do this and how much it's safe to give. But one thing that's not intuitively obvious is that actually the flow rate is proportional to the length of the catheter, not the gauge or the diameter of the catheter. And so what this means is if you're doing resuscitation fluids, you want to put in a very short catheter, okay? But also remember any time, if you have a foal that you think is septicemic or you're concerned about infections, anything you do to that foal is a good way to introduce further infections. So again, wear gloves with the foals. And when you're particularly taking blood samples or, or putting catheters in, make sure to do everything sterilely. So if we have foals that are hypovolemic, as you would expect in an adult horse, they're gonna have tacky mucous membranes, increased skin tent, their legs are gonna be cold, and they're gonna have an increased capillary refill time. Now, skin tent in foals, I think is best measured by using the skin on their upper eyelid. It, the neck doesn't seem to be terribly reliable. The skin on their eye, above their eye is a little bit thinner. So this one 
in my, in my experience works well. So again, we now, we're talking about resuscitation fluids. We're not talking about maintenance fluids for these folds. This is a fold that is down and out. So it's actually quite easy to remember because you don't have to remember a dose. It's a liter for a normal size fold and you can do this every 20 minutes for up to four boluses. So you give the first one and you get it in as fast as you can. You wait about 15 minutes, you repeat your clinical exam and then you make a decision whether you need to do it again. And you can certainly add 5% glucose or dextrose, just dilute it down from a bottle of 50% if you, need to, if you need to spike the fluids. And again, in millimoles per liter, we're going to aim to keep our blood glucose between 4 and 5.5. Now, foals, unlike adult horses, have a, do have a limited ability to excrete sodium. And so we tend to use sodium-restricted fluids for all cases but diarrhea, because in, in diarrhea cases, they are... Uh, they're, they're losing quite a lot of sodium. So generally a, a good rule of thumb for isotonic or hypotonic fluids is lactated ringers or lactated ringers with 5% dextrose. Now isotonic fluids are, um, isotonic fluids are readily available and you'll have them in your car and you'll have them in your clinic. So again, it's useful also just to carry some dextrose around as well. I'm sure a lot of you have used these central venous catheters and know how to use them, but they're, they're a little bit like, to the uninitiated, they're a bit like doing an epidural in a horse. These aren't rocket science. They're not that complicated to do, but they're, they're a bit fiddly the first time you put one in, but they're super useful. So this is the actual catheter itself, and they're actually made of polyurethane. So they're very soft. They're very well tolerated by the foals, but as you can see, the, 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 internal diameter is not very large. So these are not, these are not gonna be suitable for resuscitation fluids, but these are good for maintenance fluids and administration of medication. So let me just show you how to put these in. Okay, so the first thing, sorry. Uh, I hope there's no dialogue on this one. Okay, so the first thing is you've got this, um, you've got this loop of wire, okay? And this is your guide wire, okay? So remember these are central venous catheters. These are designed to, head down towards people's hearts, okay? Then what we have is we have, sorry, okay, okay? This is all done sterilely. Everything's been prepped sterilely. I'm wearing sterile gloves, but you see the guide wire goes through this huge needle, okay? Now the needle is going to have been put into the Foles jugular vein via a clipped and prepped area with a bleb of local anesthetic. Okay, this is really important, okay? Don't let go of this, the end of this wire because okay. if you lose it, it's just gonna go sailing down towards the foal's heart and you're not gonna get it back, okay? Then you remove your wire. Sorry, I don't know why this one is upside down. Bear with me, okay? So what we've got now is we have a, we'll do this one again. We have a guide wire on its own there. that is in the foal's, okay? So we take that out. And make sure you don't lose these sharps in a, in a box. Okay, now this little plastic bit, they're not in every kit, okay. but what they are is they're, it's actually a tissue spreader, okay? And what it does is it just slightly enlarges the hole that goes through the horse, the foal skin, okay? So you do a little back and forth motion just like that, okay? Now again, this is the, this is the bit that's outside the foal. This bit is now heading down towards the foal's heart. So we do not, do not want to lose hold of this wire. And now we're going to feed our catheter over. Again, this is really important. We grab that end and then we place the catheter. Okay, so th they're fiddly the first time you do them, but they're fantastic. They don't take much time at all to put in. And then if you can see in this little fold just here, um, I, tend to, I tend to stitch these in with little butterfly stitches with a, just little pieces of tape rather than sewing it directly to the skin. Super glue is very good and then it's held in with elastoplast or e-band or whatever whatever you want to put on it. If you look here, this is a fold that also you can see this is his little oxygen cannula just here. So he's, he's going out for a spin with his mother. So he's been disconnected from everything. But if you need to do this, the best thing to do is to put a wrap of your elasticated bandage around the foal's muzzle. Be very careful not to tape their mouth shut. I did that once and I couldn't figure out why the foal couldn't actually open its mouth but then you have this inner layer and then you can tape everything else on top of that. And it just means that you're not 
constantly tearing the fold's hair off by changing this. So, so we have this one underlying layer and then everything else gets taped to that. Okay. Catheters can go wrong without question. This is just, so these need to be examined at least once a day. And what I do with the catheter caps is I change, these cost pennies. So I change these every day, at least once every 24 hours. I just throw, in, uh, just throw that out and put a new one on there. These are the, these are the butterfly, uh, little butterfly bits with tape and, I, and that I've sewn to the fold. Okay, just it seems to be a little bit less uncomfortable for them. Okay, so again, we still need to we still need to keep our blood glucose in in an acceptable level. And all this is is this is just your basic glucometer that pretty much every practice has one of, and the and they're just your normal blood glucose test strips. Just double check. In this country, it's usually millimoles per liter. But just double check that that is indeed the that is indeed the uh, the units that are being used. Okay. Okay. So this is where the urine the urine specific gravity is super useful. So, in contrast to adult horses, in adult horses we want them to actually concentrate their urine to say that their kidneys are functioning normally. In foals, it's the other way around. We want them to have very dilute, effectively isosthenuric urine. Okay, so normal for a foal is far lower than it normal in an adult horse. And normal is between 1002 and 1012. Now where this where this becomes very useful is that if we measure urine specific gravity and invariably they pee in front of you when you have turned your back or you don't have the pot in your hand, if that's the case just catch it in your hands. You're not it's not going to give you anything. But if we have a urine specific gravity of greater than 1020 that tells us that that foal is dehydrated. And another useful conclusion that we can draw from that is if a foal is drinking enough milk and we're not supplementing the foal with additional things and they're maintaining their isosthenuric or 1002 to 1012 urine, then we know that foal is receiving adequate nutrition, which is excellent. Now the complicated, well not complicated, but the formula at the bottom here is about, is about calculating, um, sorry, it's about calculating bicarbonate. Now, this is something that, um, this is something that if you, this is for foals that have an acidosis, whether it's a respiratory or metabolic acidosis. So if you have a foal that is, that you're actually treating it in the clinic and you can run a blood gas on it, it will, your blood gas will give you this base excess just here, okay? But if you're supplementing a foal intravenously with bicarb, it's always useful to remember the things that can kill them quickly. And bicarb administration too quickly is one of them. So we use this formula very specifically. It's their body weight in kilograms times 0.4. This is higher than in, in adult horses because they're a larger percentage body water. And the base excess, the base excess will be expressed as a negative number on your blood gas. But, and what that gives you is the milli equivalence of bicarb needed. Now, if you, if you have a foal that is really acidotic, you want to replace half of the bicarb requirement in the first six hours, and then you want to replace a quarter, the rem another quarter in another six hours, and another quarter in another six hours. But actually, fluid correction of um, dehydration and hypovolemia goes a long way towards, towards uh, decreasing the acidosis. So it's, it's not, it's not in every case that you're going to need to do bicarb. The other, but the other, as a practical tip, the other way that you can use bicarb, and this is most frequently going to be foals with diarrhea, is you can actually give them oral bicarb, and this is basically baking soda, and you give them between 12 and 50 grams of oral bicarb three or four times a day, and that can, that can help enormously, and that, because you're giving it orally, is very safe. So again, our refractometer, which most practices are going to have, just remember when you look through it, clean it with water and, um, and zero it with water. But just remember that there are a couple different scales on there and there's one that says USG, which is urine specific gravity. So use that one. So it is a, it's a super cheap, but incredibly practical way to help look after foals. Okay, now we need to feed them. And there's some foals that can't feed themselves. It's important to remember that if a foal is refluxing, you can't put anything further down the stomach tube, okay? But you can either feed them with these little stomach tubes that you put in and then you take out again, or you can use indwelling feeding tubes. 
And the indwelling feeding tubes, they all pretty much all have a, a little um, radio dense tip on them that actually is a bit heavier than the rest of the tube. And the idea was that you could, the idea was that you could take a radiograph and make sure you're in the right place. You don't actually need to do that because you can you can feel if, if you have your thumb as you're passing the tube, if you have your thumb on the left side of the jugular groove, you will feel the tube as it passes. So the corollary to that is if you can't feel the tube, don't think that you're in the right place. Okay, it's just like it's just a tiny version of a stomach tube in an adult horse. And the the thought was initially not to actually go through the cardia. Um, it probably doesn't matter one way or the other, to be honest. So you can put the you can put the little tube all the way down into the stomach, or you can or you can have it a little bit further back. Um, initially, you can give foals three about three hundred, almost five hundred mils by stomach tube for one or two feedings only, and then we need to back off a little bit. These are the indwelling feeding tubes. So again, we have our base layer of E band here, and and now the stomach the feeding tube is actually now taped on with subsequent layers, so it's not just not uncomfortable to the foal. This is what the tubes look like. You can get these multi-port ones. Some of them have little stylets in them just here. But again, remember, if, if you can't feel this tip past your thumb, then just assume that you're in the wrong place and try again. So if you, if you have a healthy normal foal, they're actually going to nurse um, five to seven times an hour for about two minutes at a time. So they, they will do um, you know, little and often, basically, okay? But if you've got a foal that's not nursing, you can feed them with this indwelling feeding tube. And, and if you're doing this at a client's premises, you can give them some ground rules, and it is perfectly feasible that they can feed a foal via a stomach tube, okay? Enteral feeding is preferred for keeping the enterocytes happy, but again, if, you, if, you're, if you've got a refluxing foal, then that's not going to be an option, and then you need to rethink the situation. Sometimes mares, for one reason or another, don't produce enough milk, and it, this is probably most common in maiden mares. So you can give them oral domperidone. Um, the domperidone tablets are there because it's a, human, it's a human drug. I think it's something like, I want to say 50, five zero tablets once a day, but it can be very useful. The other thing is that domperidone, it's, it's certainly not what domperidone is licensed for, but if you have a really bad-tempered brood mare, domperidone often chills them out quite a bit. So if you have one that's unpleasant and not producing enough milk, I would definitely reach for the domperidone. So a, a common, um, uh, sort of a common sticking point is to think, is not recognizing that if you have a sick foal, they only require about half of the, the caloric intake as a healthy foal. And it increases, it goes, it goes by days. But if we say that a normal foal needs 20 to 30% of their body weight in milk in a day, a sick foal actually needs only about half of this. Because if we give them too much, we risk hyperglycemia, hypercapnia, and azotemia. So if we are, if we're going to need to feed them on the first day, it's going to be about 10% of their body weight. And this is where it's labor intensive. These, these foals need to be fed probably no more at, on no more than a two hour stretch at a time. So again, it's labor intensive, but then day two and day three to five, we're going to give them proportionally more. And generally with the sick neonates by, after 24 to 48 hours, you've got a good idea of, of which direction the case is going in. So the good thing is in the foals that respond, they become less labor intensive with time. We need to make sure that the feeding doesn't just stop their digestive tract and they get ileus. And, and a useful way to do that is actually just to measure them with abdominal for abdominal distension. So what you do is you take your clippers and you put a little clip in their coat along their back at a, at a set point, and you use that as your measurement in centimeters, and the owner can very easily do that. If you've got a foal that you're feeding with a stomach tube or a feeding tube, check for reflux every time beforehand. And again, most foals are going to, to respond after one to two days, and if we have a, fluid requirements are made up of both milk and IV fluids. So if you, have, if you have dehydration issues, you can also address those with IV fluids if you're not managing to get enough milk into the foal. Okay. 
hypoxemia, if you can see that a foal's mucous membranes are blue, the PaO2 is less than 40 milligrams of mercury, and you really have a hard job in front of you, okay? Foals that have significant respiratory impairment, will you'll see them do abdominal breathing, and they're really, really struggling to breathe. Now, the picture here is, this is very basic. This is a, a nasal cannula. This is a, the end of a tongue depressor that's covered in tape. If you have the facility to put one of these in a foal, the way you do it is the length of tubing that needs to go up the foal's nose should be the, the length from the nostril to the medial campus of the eye, okay? Because the idea is if you put it further than that, you're probably, you're probably only going to be inflating one or oxygenating one side of their lungs. But in a pinch, you can be practical. And I've made oxygen delivery masks out of Diet Coke bottles where I've just padded the edges of it. This is not going to necessarily be an option for long-term oxygen treatment, but in terms of resuscitation of these foals, it can be very useful. So, you know, just think practically. Ideally, we want to keep the foal sternal. Um, they, if they're, if they're lying in lateral recumbency, they need to get turned every two hours. If you are doing, if you have the facility, if you've got one in the clinic and you're doing an arterial blood gas, just remember that your PaO2 of a foal will be somewhere between 20 and 40 millimeters of mercury lower in the same foal if you take it when the foal is in lateral recumbency than when it's in sternal. So ideally, if you're going to be doing blood gases, if they're ambulatory, get them up and moving around. If they're not, just prop them up in sternal for a bit. We want to make sure that they are um, clean and dry and warm. Be careful with heat lamps because these can actually burn foals. So they really need to be at least six feet away from the foal. So this is foal social distancing, obviously. Um, above the foal to prevent burns and just be careful of flammable materials. Remember that foals have a much higher surface to volume ratio than adults and so they can quite easily become hypothermic. So this is a good use for that duvet that's sitting in the back of the cupboard that you don't use anymore. Um, this is a special foal cradle, but you can use bales of straw, you can use pillows, cover it with some sort of material so that, so that the foal doesn't, um, it doesn't abrade the foal's skin. The little dis disposable pads the, um, are very good for urine and for feces. Foal skin is really, really thin. So if you have a foal with diarrhea at least once a day with very, very, I tend to just use very dilute hibby scrub, clean their backside and their tail completely, and then apply something like zinc oxide ointment just to keep them from getting scalded. So the doubt, the, one of the real problems is the 24 hour care, okay? And the lack of trained attendants is really one of the main hurdles for on-farm care. So written lists and protocols are very useful as are notes of when to call the attending vet. And these apply to cases that you have in the clinic or cases that you're trying to deal with with the owner. And I have, I have sheets that um, they cover a 12 hour period they pretty much cover the options in terms of possible treatments for the foal. And then once every 12 hours, and I, I tend to do two at a time, so it's a 24 hour cycle. And I go through and I list what the foal is having. And then, you, then in each little block for a treatment, you highlight it. And so it's really, it makes it much easier not to just forget things because you literally you say okay it's four o'clock in the morning i need to do all of the little yellow squares and then it, and then you can also put notes on saying you know call if this happens call if that happens you know if its heart rate goes above this if its temperature goes above of this i just wanted to tell you a little bit you, a lot of you i'm sure already know about this um, about something called the Madigan squeeze. And this is um, technically called squeeze-induced somnolence. Now, where this is really most useful is this is a way of effectively causing a foal to go to sleep. And it also is said to increase endorphins and increase their pain threshold. So it's a very good way to be able to do procedures on foals. I, I put this up here specifically because this is, this is where it comes from and I'll show you the website as well. But this is for foals that are under three days of age. Obviously you wouldn't use it on a foal that has never stood up, gotten to its feet or a foal that has um, fractured ribs or respiratory problems there. But it's actually, it's not 
it's not actually all that complicated to do. Now, these are not great videos because I, I actually just film these off of the website, but I do want to show you them because it is actually really cool. Okay, so totally healthy foal. Okay, he's got a little, this is a bolin, this little knot just here, and then you have these two half hitches. Okay, I don't know if any of you when you were in vet school were taught about how to cast a cow. I had to go through that about interlacing ropes um, to get a cow to drop down. Similar sort of idea. Okay, so then this is what happens. Okay, so this gentle pressure straight down the midline and the foal effectively appears to be asleep. Okay, you, so you can use this for putting catheters in, collecting blood samples, doing an ultrasound, changing bandages, dealing with wounds with local anesthetic. What you, and I would encourage you to look at this website if you want to use this because this is a, um, there's, there's more information about, about how to do this. But one of the key tenets is that you have to keep this gentle pressure on these ropes. That's actually what seems to be keeping them asleep. And then when you're done, And that, in theory, is all there is to it. So the other time that it tends to get used is in dummy foals. And there is probably largely anecdotal evidence that people have used this in dummy foals, and it's just like flipping a switch and they stand up and they're normal. Um, more often than not, it doesn't do anything, but it's probably not going to do any harm. So if you are dealing with a dummy foal, which is a whole different discussion, you can keep this in the back of your mind because there have been reported success stories. Okay, um, I'm just going to quickly whiz through some specific conditions of, of septicemia. This was one of my favorite patients. Her name was Chloe. She was one of the Budweiser Clydesdale babies. That's her mother in the background, and she kindly posed next to the medicine barn. Okay, septic arthritis. Um, this, this treatment of septic arthritis and osteomyelitis is also a talk in its own right on foals. But what I would say is it is very feasible to lavage out joints in the field, okay? You can see this foal is just lying on what looks like a picnic rug, okay? And if anybody wants protocols for how to do this or more information, just let me know. It's, it's actually not complicated at all, okay? And so, so if you have a foal that has an infected joint and proper surgery or proper referral is not an option, there's certainly things that you can do. Okay, diarrhea. I love this picture because most people are not smiling this broadly while they're cleaning feces off the backside of a foal. You can see on this foal how the hair is, has already come off here, okay? So this is where the nursing care is really important. So for foals with diarrhea, obviously they're going to, they're going to have a fluid loss. The previous comments about bicarb, and this is where oral bicarb can be useful. And then, then your choice really of whether you want to use bio sponge or whether you want to use charcoal for gastrin. But really the, the crucial thing for septic foals, probably the nursing care does more than the veterinary care does. And so the nursing care is absolutely crucial. If you have a foal that you, this is just a trick, but if you have a foal that you feel that there's an indication to put on metronidazole, um, and you, for some reason, can't give it to the foal orally because it's refluxing, you can give trinidazole rectally, but you just double the oral dose. Okay. Pneumonia, again, their chest will often, it's often hard to hear the abnormal noises. So that can, that doesn't mean that, that everything is normal. They don't cough a lot. You're looking for increased respiratory effort and rate. Chest radiographs are quite easy to do in foals. And you can get both lateral. Whoops, sorry. You can get both laterals and um, these views as well. When you're doing these, be careful not to pull. Well, for both laterals and ventrodorsal views, don't pull the forearms too far because what it does is it tends to rotate the chest, and then your heart looks like it's in a very odd place. Meningitis. Um, I've seen a number of these over the years. These, you need, if you're going to definitively diagnose this, um, it needs to be done with a CSF tap. But one of the great drugs for use in foals is midazolam. Diazepam is fine as well. But I was always struck by the fact that you can actually do a, an Atlanta occipital CSF tap on a foal that has just been 
sedated with midazolam, so it's not anesthetized. And a CSF tap, again, it's, it's, it's sort of a daunting procedure, but they're not that difficult to do. But there are certainly foals who are diagnosed with meningitis probably a bit spuriously, so a CSF tap is really going to be your gold standard. Um, and again, think about, think about your antibiotics, which are going to cross the blood-brain barrier. So cefquinone is a good replacement for chloramphenicol when they can get hold of it. Okay, and again, we've said that the management is really, really important. They need to be clean, warm, and dry. They need to be turned. They need to be encouraged to stand up and walk around and nurse. Where you don't want to do this is if you have a foal that is either premature or dismature and you're concerned about lack of ossification in either the knees or the hocks because they don't want to be walking around on those. Um, dip the navel four times a day and change your injection caps if you've got a catheter into it. This picture just here just shows you how, easily, how easy it is for a foal to excoriate their skin. So if you're called out to see a foal and it's already got one of these just here, then the conclusion from that is that foal has been recumbent for, has had periods of recumbency which may not have been noticed. This is just a series of pictures I've put together on, other than this little guy down in the corner who I thought was hilarious sleeping. He was just asleep, but his mat had fallen on his head and he wasn't too fussed about it. But all of these are the same foal over the space of about 10 minutes. So this is where you want them. This is where they end up. He doesn't really look like he should bend quite this way, but they can do. And this, if, this is a foal that's got an oxygen line on and you, you look through the box door and you see this and in the time it takes you to get over the foal, he's taken that one step further and it's all pinged apart. But easy enough to put back together again. Okay, so just the very, very um, common sense ways to try to decrease the likelihood of, of infection. Folding box hygiene, bring the mare to where she's going to fall before she falls, so she has time to build up local immunity. Take care of the umbilicus, make sure that the foal has colostrum. And if the mare wasn't vaccinated for tetanus, say six weeks before she fold, then you can give the foal tetanus antitoxin when it's born. And tetanus antitoxin in foals has a significantly longer duration of protection than adult horses. In adult horses, we clinically think it gives them about three days. In foals, it gives them about 45 days. So very useful. And then you're hoping that they're going to, their immune system is going to take over from there. Okay, just a couple notes on transporting a sick foal. And owners are often very resistant to this idea this is in Eastern Europe somewhere, so um, that's probably a bit of a squeeze in there. But it's the point is, you don't need them if if you if you have gotten to the point where you need to transport a foal, you don't need the mare right away. All you need is the foal. So just bring the foal. Okay. This picture I just loved. It was it was a Shetland pony, and the only box from Lamborn Racehorse Transport was an eight horse box. So you don't need something quite this deluxe necessarily. But it does raise the point, as with any horse owner, is to have some arrangements made for transportation. Um, just, some, just some additional notes on how to get organized if you're going to be transporting the foal. But in the context of what we're talking about, you're going to be taking the foal into your own clinic. So this, this probably doesn't apply. Right, I know this is tiny print, but this is, this is a, um, I give this to interns and whatnot, and this is my cheat sheet for checking in a sick foal. And literally, you just start at the top, and you work your way down to the bottom. And if you've remembered to do all of these things, then you're very unlikely to have actually forgotten something. Um, these are three... These are out of the fourth edition of ours equine surgery, and I think these are brilliant little charts. Okay, they're, they're done by an American anesthetist, so some of the drugs we wouldn't necessarily have. But what I like about them is this is analgesics, okay, and they've split it into neonates, so a month or younger, and then pediatric and juvenile foals. And those are that sort of young, slightly older foal age group are ones that it's often difficult to find published information about. So that's pain management. We've also got sedation, and again, this is this is split into age, but also bad general condition and good general condition. And again, remember these 
benzodiazepine drugs, midazolam or diazepam, they are absolutely fantastic in foals. And also anesthesia of healthy foals, again, split into either a month or younger or one to four months of age. And that's just, those just have, it's just a nice useful list there. Okay, in terms of resources, a couple of, a couple of options for you. Um, as you can see from the number of post-its, I really like this one. Okay, so this is John Madigan from California, as in the Madigan Squeeze. What's really great about this book is that it literally, it's just bullet points. And it'll often say, uh, for instance, in the fluid section, it'll say, if you need emergency resuscitation, don't read this, go to page whatever at the back of the chapter. So this is, this is a fantastically useful little book. You can't buy it from... You can't buy it just out of a bookshop. So on that, that uh, website that I gave you, you have to order it directly from his company, but very easy to do. This one was edited by my good friend Pam Wilkins, um, definitely a guru of neonatology. This is a, this is a pretty heavy duty book here, actually, but it is a, it's a very useful book. And then this one on the right, um, Pam contributed to this one as well. This is a super book, actually. This is great. And what it's done is it basically, it's a case, it's a, a foal per chapter, and the, case, the chapter is predicated on what's wrong with the foal. So it might be a foal that has, it's a dummy foal or it has diarrhea. And then it talks you through the case, and then it gives you a, a, a review of all the things that you need to know about foals with diarrhea. So this is a, this is a lovely book as well. Okay, um, yes, I'm sure you heard the, the, or read the news today that Trump has pulled the funding for the World Health Organization, so um, no rocket scientists there for sure. And that was a bit of a whiz through intensive care of foals, but um, if there are any questions, I will be happy to try to answer them. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you.